So I want to finish talking about the kingdom animalia. Well, we have already gone through this, that for our purposes, we have four kingdoms of eukaryotes, animalia, which is the true animals, plantae, true plants, fungi, the fungi, and the protista, which is everything else. And those first three are mostly pretty much kind of multicellular with some degree of cell differentiation. Um, although there's a few instances where that's kind of violated like, like yeast in the case of fungi. Um, and again, this is not exactly how the pros would do it, but for what we need to do in this class, it'll work. And we were talking about animals. And if you remember, I had been talking about you know, common features that animals have. Uh, because the kingdom animalia includes a lot of things that you might not automatically think of when you hear the word animal. Uh, if I ask people to name animals, they mostly get cow, horse, dog, cat, sheep, you know, the ones you learned in nursery school. Uh, but animalia also includes sponges and jellyfish and slugs and spiders, uh, all of those things. And uh, somebody mute your mic, thanks. Um, yeah, somebody, I'm getting feedback through your mic. If you could mute that, that would be just lovely. Um, okay. Sorry, just kind of weird to hear my own voice on a staticky three second delay. Okay, please mute whoever that is. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I can mute all of the mics, but I might have to go out of the slideshow to do it. Um, anyway, um, so what makes animals is multi-celled cell differentiation, cells held together, not with cell walls, but with a meshwork of fibers of protein, um, the most important of which, although not the only one, is a protein called collagen. Uh, there's actually something like 30 different types of collagen um, and it can be different types of collagen do different things. Uh, you've got very loose extracellular matrix in places like the loose tissue under the skin of your face. Uh, collagen can also be extremely tough like a, like a rope or a cable as in the case of your tendons. You know, the cords that link your muscles to your bones, uh, like the Achilles tendon you can feel at the back of your heel, uh, or the hamstrings tendons you can feel on the inside of your knee joint. Um, those are made of collagen, among other things. The cells in an animal are organized in all except the sponges, the, the simplest of all, the cells are organized into units called tissues. That's a grouping, very often a sheet of similar cells uh, into a, you know, a, a larger unit. And we can talk about animal bodies as consisting of four basic types of tissue. Epithelial tissue is tissue that lines something. Uh, so the inside of your mouth, is lined with epithelial tissue. Uh, the inside of your nose is lined with epithelial tissue. The inside of all of your digestive system, you know, mouth to anus, uh, the inside of whatever reproductive system you happen to have, uh, the inside of your bladder and your lungs, um, all of those are made of epithelial tissue, that lining. Uh, your skin, which I guess is the lining of all of you, as it were, is epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue can often be modified to secrete stuff. So the salivary glands in your mouth are made of folded, modified epithelial tissue. Uh, you ever get your tongue in exactly the right position to cause this little spray of spit to come shooting out of your mouth? 
I had a friend, like I had a friend of mine in high school who could do that on command and would like walk up to me and just twist his tongue in a funny way. And next thing I know, I've got this little spray of spit. Um, yeah, he was using um, epithelial tissue modified for secretion. So a lot of your liver and your pancreas and things like that are epithelial. Connective tissues generally used for structural support. Um, in answer to the question, if anybody needs to use the bathroom, step, step aside and uh, do it and, and come back. You know, it, it does not personally bother me. Uh, if you miss material, you just need to pick it up. Um, okay, uh, so bone is an example of connective tissue. Uh, your tendons, again, like your Achilles tendon at the back of your heel or uh, the great big tendon that connects your trapezius muscle to the back of your skull um, or the hamstrings tendons at the back of your knee. Uh, that's all connective tissue. Uh, cartilage is connective tissue. Uh, what's under the skin of your nose and your external ears. Uh, the cartilage that's... Uh, forms the uh, surfaces that rub together in your joints, uh, where if it goes away, you have bad arthritis. That's connective tissue. Uh, we incidentally also count blood as a connective tissue. And then nervous tissue transmits signals. Uh, so your nerves and your brain and your spinal cord are made of nervous tissue. And muscle tissue is the only tissue that, that contracts, uh, the only tissue that moves on its own in a coordinated way. And that is, duh, your muscles. So here's what some of these look like. Uh, this happens to be the lining of a human fallopian tube. Uh, that's the tube that carries uh, egg cells from the ovary to the uterus. Uh, this is a subtype of epithelial tissue called columnar epithelium. And I'm drawing a line around one of it now. Each one of these things, it looks like a column. There, I'm just picking out some isolated ones and putting an outline around them. Uh, each one of those is an epithelial cell. Uh, so that's one right there. That's one. That's one. Oh, you know, what the heck, uh, that's one. Uh, you can see the nucleus in each one of them. Uh, the inside of your mouth is lined with epithelial cells of a different shape. It's called squamous epithelium. Um, and the cells, instead of looking like columns are very flat and they stick together at their edges uh, a little bit like floor tiles. Uh, so you have different types of epithelium. By the way, under that layer of epithelium, all of this stuff that, you know, you have cells and then that kind of tangled blue spaghetti looking things, that's not epithelial tissue, that is connective tissue. Um, that's there basically to hold the epithelial tissue together, you know, like the, um, I don't know, like the, like the adhesive under the floor tiles and uh, to support the shape of the fallopian tubes. So there's actually connective tissue in here and all that blue spaghetti stuff, that's extracellular matrix. I'll show you more pictures of this, but one thing to remember is that body organs are made up of multiple tissue types. Uh, so your fallopian tubes would have epithelial tissue lining them, connective tissue holding them together, uh, probably some nervous tissue as well, not much in the way of muscle, uh, but something like your heart is lined with epithelium and there's connective tissue that holds it together and there's nerves that regulate its beat. And of course there's muscle tissue that actually does the beating. Uh, so most of your organs consist of several of these tissue types. Often it's all four. So there's epithelial tissue, connective tissue right here. This is some human cartilage. Uh, the cells are in these spaces. 
So that's a cell, that's a cell. Some of them might have dropped out, but there's spaces where cells were. And then all of this pinkish purple stuff in between the cells, that's extracellular matrix. Um, very tough, uh, kind of, kind of um, it can, like your nose cartilage is pretty flexible. Your joint cartilage is a lot stiffer, uh, kind of like different grades of rubber, I guess. There's some nervous tissue. That's a, um, uh, that's what human brain cells look like. Uh, you can see the big kind of brown staining ones have branches coming off them, like this one right here. The nucleus is right there. And then the cell body is shaped kind of like a diamond. And then you can see branching off of it, you have all of these branches. Those connect with other, uh, other brain cells. So all of these little red lines that I'm drawing right now, uh, those are branches of that, uh, of that brain cell uh, connecting with other brain cells. That's how your brain is basically wired. Uh, we probably won't have a lot of time to talk about science of the human brain. Uh, we do have Dr. Padberg and Dr. Puri in our department. If anybody's curious about learning more, you might look them up. And then finally, there's some muscle tissue. Uh, the cell nuclei are these spots off to the side. One of the funny things about human skeletal muscle is that each fiber is a single cell, but it's got many nuclei. Cells don't always have just one. So each of these spots is a nucleus. And then the vast majority of the cell is packed full of fibers of special proteins. Uh, there's about 50 of them. The two important ones are called actin and myosin, and they're able to slide past each other uh, with a kind of ratchet action. Maybe we can talk about how that works later, um, making the muscle able to contract. Um, incidentally, muscle can only contract by itself. A muscle can't stretch. Um, the way you stretch a muscle is by contracting a muscle in the opposite direction. So if you flex your elbow, you're contracting your biceps muscle and stretching out your triceps. And then if you extend your elbow so that your arm is completely straight, you're stretching your biceps and flexing your triceps. Uh, muscles have to work in opposing pairs like that because by itself, a muscle can't make itself any longer. A muscle can only get longer if another muscle pulls on it. Okay, cool. In some of the simplest true animals, that's the phylum Cnidaria. Uh, that's, I will never ask you this on a test, but Cnidaria is Greek for stinging nettles. Uh, that's a plant with a sting. And jellyfish and sea anemones and corals have stings. And the body's made up of several types of tissue that are kind of wrapped around each other. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the details. If you really want to know, you can take Biology 4401 someday. But as I was saying earlier, in most animals, you'll get two, three, or four tissue types coming together to form these integrated units that we call organs. Uh, that happens to be a section through somebody's small intestine. And there's epithelial tissue lining the inside. So this stuff up here is epithelial tissue. I'm just kind of going to try draw sort of a block of it. That's your epithelial layer. That does the work of absorbing uh, digested food. Uh, there's a muscle layer. Right there is one layer of muscle. And right there is a second layer of muscle. So those two layers right there work uh, to push food through the intestine. And then you have connective tissue like 
there and there and there that's holding everything together. And you can't really see them in this picture, but there are also nerves that are involved in controlling um, the action of your intestine. Um, it tends to speed up when you're relaxed and slow down if um, you're, you're frightened or under stress, uh, for example. Um, and that's done with nerves. So even though I can't really point to one, um, you've got all four types of tissue um, in your intestines. And then several organs integrated together make up an organ system. In uh, humans, there are, we recognize, I believe it's 16 different organ systems that we recognize in human anatomy. This one just happens to show the human digestive system uh, from mouth to anus. Uh, you see the stomach and the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas and the and da 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 da. Um, and if you want to know more about these, we've got perfectly good courses in anatomy and physiology and in structure and function of the human body. And some of you might end up taking those as part of your major. Um, of course, if you go, if you get into uh, physical therapy, you can actually take, take a human anatomy course where they dissect cadavers, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, right. Anyway, so that's several organs integrated together for one major bodily function makes up an organ system. And that's all of the the living biodiversity I've got time for, but what I haven't mentioned yet is that we have life on Earth today, of course. You can see it outside your window, but there is also a ton of dead biodiversity uh, to cover, uh, like Sue the Tyrannosaurus here, shown at the um, Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. And as far back as I mean, fossils have actually been found in like caveman sites, uh, the ancient Greeks knew about them. Um, they're Native American tribes that had legends about them. Um, and a fossil is any trace of an organism, a living thing that used to be alive and now isn't. Um, if you go to the beach and you find an empty shell, that is technically a fossil. Uh, if you split open the right types of rock, uh, you can find all sorts of fossils. Um, mo much of the Ozarks, you could potentially find fossils in the rocks anywhere up there. Uh, although they're more common in some rock layers than others. There's not a lot of good places close to Conway to find them. Um, now and again, you get lucky. Uh, but there's some rock layers in the Ozarks that are quite rich. Uh, there is some very rich hunting ground south of the Washita Mountains in the greater Nashville metro area, Nashville, Arkansas. Um, yeah, you've got a lot of potential to find these in the state. And when we say fossil, we include both body fossils and trace fossils. A body fossil is an actual body part, uh, like this uh, skeleton of a fish that um, has been very carefully excavated out of rocks at uh, Fossil Butte National Monument in the state of Wyoming outside the town of Kemmerer. Uh, well worth a visit if you're out that way. Down below, I took that picture at a place called Clayton Lake State Park in far Northeast New Mexico, uh, real close to the Texas Panhandle. Uh, not close to anything in particular, which suits me just fine. It's kind of lonely. Uh, there's a nice lake there uh, but the lake is man-made, and when they built the dam to create the lake, they bulldozed off a lot of earth 
and what they exposed when they bulldozed off a lot of soil and rock was a rock layer that has things like this in it. I'm tracing one out right there. So there's one. There's actually one up here. They're a little bit weathered. Uh, the park is not really taking that great care of them. Uh, but these are dinosaur footprints. The uh, Clayton Lake, although, like I said, they've crumbled a bit because they haven't always taken very good care of them and they're not in very resistant rock. Uh, but at least when I was there, Clayton Lake was one of the best places uh, to see dinosaur footprints still in place. Um, and that's an example of a trace fossil, whether it's the footprint of a dinosaur, the burrow of an ancient worm, anything like that. Both of those are what we call fossils. With rare exceptions, all fossils are found in rocks that are called sedimentary rocks, which just means that they were formed by usually water or sometimes air laying down layers of mud, silt, or sand. Um, if you have ever had, I hope this has never happened to you, uh, but if your house ever floods, sometimes when the water goes down, you're left with a thick layer of mud all over the carpet. That's how sedimentary rocks form. Uh, if you were to go down to, oh, Pilot Town, Louisiana, right where the Mississippi River hits the Gulf of Mexico, you'd see a lot of very brown river water uh, brown because it's full of sediment, full of mud, washing into the ocean, and that mud and silt that the Mississippi River is carrying slowly sinks to the bottom and builds up deposits on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. That's another example of sedimentary rocks forming. Uh, some types of sedimentary rock don't form as particles like mud or sand, um, they form by evaporation or chemical reactions. Uh, limestone is one example, uh, so is rock salt. Uh, there's lots of others. Um, virtually all of the rock that uh, is exposed at the surface of Arkansas is sedimentary rock, by the way. Um, there are two other types of rock called igneous and metamorphic, but we've got very little of that at the surface, um, except for that one little granite quarry just south of uh, south of Little Rock, south of the uh, south of the the I thirty US one sixty seven interchange. Uh, aside from that, we're pretty much all sedimentary here. Oh. Almost forgot. Um, here's something fun for you to do. If you go to the library, you know, that's the, the building with the, uh, the Starbucks and the computers, and I think there's a book in there somewhere. Um, if you go to the front of the Torreson Library, look carefully at the columns and the panels of gray stone uh, that are up there on the front. That's actually rock that was quarried uh, pretty close to here, uh, possibly Batesville. Uh, so that's local, local stone. And if you look very carefully at it and you hit the right places, you'll actually see uh, little bits of shell, for example, in the, inside that rock. Um, the rock that makes up Torreson's, not the brick, but the gray stone, is actually loaded with fossils. Not all of them are really obvious, uh, but there's a few that um, uh, you'll find a few if you're patient. Uh, so those are fossils in a sedimentary rock. So what are we gonna do with these things? Well, as I was saying earlier, I do like talking about the history of scientific discovery, because one of the lessons that I want to try to bring is that science does not just magically appear. 
It is not handed down on Mount Sinai. It is not whispered into our ears by the angels. People make science. Science grows and sometimes has setbacks by the actions of people. And every so often I'll bring in people uh, that I think are important to the story. I'm not going to test you much on biographical detail. Uh, I will not make you remember that this guy uh, actually quit science midway through his career, uh, became a Roman Catholic priest, and uh, is currently a candidate for sainthood. Uh, so you don't have to know that Nicholas Steno has been beatified, which is like one step below becoming a uh, uh, becoming officially named as a saint. Uh, you don't have to know that he spent the last years of his life uh, risking his life ministering to the Catholic community um, in Denmark, uh, which was ruled by some hardcore Protestants back in the days when that sort of thing was getting people killed. Don't worry about that. Focus on the ideas. Focus on what people did. And what Steno did was spend a lot of time trying to think about how fossils formed, how they got there. You know, why is it that you can break open some rock in the Ozarks and booyah, you find a shell? Uh, why is it that you can poke around on an eroded hillside um, somewhere between Nashville and Murfreesboro, Arkansas, and rarely, but it does happen, turn up a dinosaur bone? Again, they're not common, but that is where you would find them if you're hunting in, in Arkansas. And Stano was the first to try to puzzle out why they would form. And he came up with some laws that should probably be called really good rules of thumb. Um, there are cases where they can lead you astray. Uh, they are not unbreakable principles, but they are really handy for looking at sedimentary rocks. And the first is sometimes called Steno's Law of Superposition. When sedimentary rocks form, they form in layers uh, like these. This is the Vermilion Cliffs um, somewhere on the, uh, like on the Utah-Arizona border, north of the Grand Canyon. Um, and you can see it's made of rock layers of different colors. And Steno realized that if you have a stack of layers like this, the lowest layers have to be the oldest and the highest layers have to be the youngest. And imagine you have a bathtub full of water and one day you throw in a shovel full of sand. Well, the sand grains are gonna sink to the bottom and maybe spread out a little bit and they'll make a layer of sand on the bottom of your tub. And then the next day you throw in a shovel full of mud well, the tiny mud grains will sink to the bottom and form a second layer on top of the sand. And then on the third day, let's say you throw in a shovel full of pebbles. The pebbles will sink to the bottom and form a third layer on top of the mud on top of the sand. It works the same way for sedimentary rocks. The lowest layers in a stack are the oldest layers. The highest layers are the youngest, and the in-betweens are in-between. All right, and again, you could demonstrate why that works with a bathtub and plenty of dirt and a little time. Steno does not say anything about how old rocks are. On the left, that is, I took that picture, hunting for fossils in western Utah. Um, years ago. Um, this is a view of a range of mountains called the Drum Mountains. I don't know why. And you can see it's made of layers of rock. And we reckon now, later I'll try to explain where we get these numbers, but don't worry about it for the moment. 
but we currently reckon that those layers are roughly 500 million years old and might have taken several million years to form. I took that picture uh, standing on the rim of Yubihibi Crater in uh, Death Valley National Park in California. Uh, it's an awesome place if you want to hike down into a volcanic crater. Uh, hiking up will kill you. Hiking up is uh, very long, steep, and completely exhausting, uh, but hiking down is fun. But if you stay on the rim, you'll notice that there are layers of rock up here on the rim of the crater. Uh, if you have, they're black and dark gray, and you may have a hard time seeing them. I'm trying to highlight parts of them up here. So we have rock layers here on the rim of Yubihibi, and we have rock layers there in the Drum Mountains. Okay, there I'm just kind of messing them up. Yubihibi, uh, we estimate would have formed a few thousand years ago. Um, there weren't Europeans uh, there, but there certainly were Native Americans when Yubihibi Crater erupted and made those layers. And they might have only taken a few weeks to form. Steno doesn't care. What's true of both of these is that the oldest layers are on the bottom of the stack. So the older layers are going to be down here and the youngest layers are going to be up here. And it's the same for Yubihibi. So all that Steno tells you is which layers are relatively older or relatively younger. So this is not where we get our ideas that the Earth is 4 billion years old. Um, we'll talk about that in time. And as Steno realized, it is possible for rock layers to get eroded. Uh, they can be tipped and folded and deformed. Uh, this is a place where the rock layers have been crumpled like a beer can against my grandmother's forehead. Uh, you can see that's a rock layer that I'm tracing out that is uh, bent into an S shape. Um, by the way, this is exposed south of Hot Springs on McLeod Street. Um, the rock layers closer to home that show this best would be the ones that are exposed out on Hogan Road in Conway, um, where they blew, blasted Hogan Road through Cadron Ridge so it could join up with Highway 64. Uh, so if you're on Hogan Road, you might drive past the new post office and the big church and those giant apartment complexes. And then you kind of go up a hill uh, with, with rock cliffs on either side. And then you come down and there's Highway 64 and you're you can go drive to Plummerville or something. Um, those rock layers that you would see there on, on Hogan um, are actually bent like this. They're, they're tilted at about a 50 degree angle. That's a case where the rock layers are not fully following the rules. There are cases where you can have an older and a younger layer, but no middle. Uh, we call that an unconformity. Uh, there's even a few cases where rock layers can be completely turned over. Usually it's pretty straightforward with a little practice to recognize when this has happened. So there are things that can mess with Steno's law. That's why it's not a law. It's a, it's a rule of thumb. But usually we can tell when the rocks have been messed with. Okay, next dead white dude I wanna talk about is William Smith, um, better known as the Fresh Prince. Actually, I'm kidding, it's not that William Smith. Uh, this William Smith was not a rapper or an actor. Uh, he was a surveyor and a civil engineer, and he worked in England right about the time that England was going through this thing called the Industrial Revolution that you should have heard about in your history classes, or maybe that you will hear about. Uh, England is industrializing rapidly, and one of the ways that was used to get products from point A to point B 
was canals. Um, there were canals being dug all over Britain uh, because water is a pretty cheap way to move large amounts of stuff. So if you've got a factory that needs huge amounts of coal, uh, you might just dig a canal from the coal mines uh, to your factory. And then if you wanted to ship whatever your factory was making, let's say it's iron, uh, you could use a canal to ship your iron from your factory to the city where it's going to be uh, sold. So this is before railroads have really kicked in. Uh, this is certainly before interstate highways. This is the time when they're digging canals. And because William Smith uh, was a surveyor, he worked on a lot of canal digging projects. And that meant he got to look very closely at the sedimentary rock layers under the soil of England, probably more than anybody did. So he looked at a lot of rock layers. He picked up quite a lot of fossils and recorded what layers he'd got them from. And one of the things that he realized is that fossils always occurred in an order of appearance. Then once you knew what it was, you could predict it. You could predict if you were in one place and you had fossil A appearing below fossil B, then you could go to another place. And if you found A and B, A would also be below B and therefore A would be older than B. And that order of appearance of fossils was the same all over England. Um, in some cases, the same all over the world. And we call this Smith's Law of Succession. And here's an example, I'll show you how this works. Uh, this is drawn in part on stuff that I have gone out and done. I'm not as mobile as I used to be, uh, but in my younger days, I used to hike all over the Western United States, uh, spent a lot of time in the Mojave Desert, uh, spent a lot of time in the Las Vegas area, although as little time in Las Vegas itself as I could get away with, uh, because ew, um, because, you know, I'd much rather sleep under the stars than hang out in casinos. That bores me. Anyway, on the left, there's a rough diagram of rock layers that make up the mountains that I used to climb. Uh, places you're not likely to have heard of unless you've been out that way, um, like the Spring Mountains and the Nopa Mountains and the Resting Springs Mountains. And... Um, um, the, uh, oh, there's a bunch of them out there. And these are the four rock layers that make up an awful lot of these mountains. On the bottom, there is a bunch of mixed types of rock, uh, partly shale, sandstone, things like that, called the Wood Canyon Formation, uh, because it's found in a place called Wood Canyon and elsewhere. That's the oldest. On top of that, there is a rock layer called the Zabriskie Quartzite, uh, which is very, um, very hard. On top of that, you've got a layer with lots of uh, shales and some limestones. There's lots of different rock types in it called the Carrara Formation. And sitting on top of that, there's a rock layer named after an old mine. It's called the Bonanza King Dolomite. Uh, dolomite is like limestone. Um, with magnesium instead of calcium, but not important. It's just a rock type. Anyway, on the right are some of the fossils I used to go looking for. They are an extinct group um, of arthropods, meaning they are distant cousins of spiders and scorpions and bugs, and they're called trilobites. Uh, if you saw one crawling around, you might think it was a giant roly-poly or something like that. Uh, that's, that's the closest way I can describe what they would have looked like uh, when they were alive. And they're common as fossils in some areas. And if you go looking in rock layers at the bottom of the Wood Canyon formation, you find a genus of trilobite called uh, Nevadia right there. These are the genus names 
uh, the species names aren't really important for our purposes here. So there's Nevadia. The Zabriskie quartzite doesn't have huge numbers of fossils in it. There are a few, but you'll have much better hunting if you look in the lower levels of the Carrara formation and you find a trilobites in the genus Olanellus. And then if you hike up the Carrara formation and look at it just under the Bonanza King dolomite, you find trilobites of a different appearance and we put these in genus Cispocephalus. And they're all different from each other. Um, certainly Nevadia and Olanellus look similar, but with a little practice, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. You don't need special skills. You just need a little experience and, and a little care at uh, observing them. And the reason I've dragged you through all of this is you can find these fossils in other places in North America and even on other continents. Uh, you could find these fossils in um, over at the opposite end of North America in uh, the western side of Newfoundland in Canada. Uh, you could find some in um, northern Georgia if you look in the right spots. Uh, you can find some in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, you could find these in parts of Siberia. Uh, there are lots of places where you could find these trilobites. Uh, you won't find any of them in Arkansas because our rocks are just a little too young. But if you find these species anywhere in the world, you always find Nevadia underneath Olanellus, therefore older than Olanellus. And Olanellus is always underneath Cispocephalus, Sorry. Olanellus is always underneath Cispocephalus and therefore older than Cispocephalus. Cispocephalus is the youngest of the three. And it may not be immediately obvious why that's the case. It is possible that Nevadia used to live and crawl around and then it somehow evolved into Olanellus and Olanellus evolved into Cispocephalus, but it doesn't have to be. We don't know that. Um, it, mm, anyway, never mind. It is possible, but we're not there yet. I haven't even started talking about biological evolution, but it doesn't really matter why it happened, just that it does. Just that whenever you find these three fossils, Nevada is always the oldest and Cispocephalus is always the youngest. And you can confirm that by going out and digging anytime that you care to, uh, as I used to do. As scientists have been doing in Western North America uh, for at least the past uh, 120 years. <laughs> And the reason that matters is that lets us define time periods in Earth history based on what was alive. Um, we could talk about the, there is a time slot in Earth history that we could call the Nevadia stage if we wanted to. And after that came a time when Nevadia was not around, but Olanellus was, and we could call that the Olanellus stage and so on. And we can build this on bigger time scales. Uh, for example, we could talk about a time period called the Age of Dinosaurs if we wanted to. Uh, that is the time slot when dinosaurs are the dominant land animals and mammals aren't very big. And we find fossil dinosaur bones in rocks that were uh, built up at this time. I always think of it in terms of automotive history. Uh, if you know your history of cars, you could divide recent history into right now, we might be living in the era of the, we might be living at the very beginning of the age of electric cars, maybe the very start. And before that we were living in the age of giant SUVs. 
And before that came the age of sensible Japanese imports. And before that came the age of station wagons with wood paneling. And before that came the age of gas guzzling party barges with fins. And before that came the age of Model Ts and so on. You could divide up US history into different periods based on what was popular for people to drive. This is a little bit like that. And that you can divide up Earth's history based on what was living at the time. You can divide that history into periods. And that's one of the most important things about life. One of the most important things that you learn is that life on Earth actually has a history. And this was accepted by about the year 1830. Um, just about everybody who had spent any time studying the matter realized that the Earth was older than anybody had suspected. Uh, the Earth was not 6,000 years old. It must be more than that there was no really good way to put a start date on it. Nobody knew exactly how old the Earth might be, but it was extremely old, indefinitely old. And the life on Earth had gone through changes in the past. The older the fossils were, the less familiar they looked. Uh, these are, by the way, some of the first dinosaur models uh, we've since revised our uh, impressions of um, what dinosaurs look like, but this is what people thought they looked like at about, uh, I think this is like 1840, 1845 is how old these models are. And let's, okay, I'm checking the chat and it's just somebody's name. Okay, that's cool. Right. And the message was clear, life on Earth has a history. And you're not going to fully understand life on Earth unless you understand something about its history. Uh, just like, you know, you can't really understand the United States unless you know something about its history. Nothing about this country makes sense unless you know something about the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, slavery, industrialization, Jim Crow, civil rights, um, World War II, all of these events in America's past. And it's the same thing for any country. You're not going to understand why that country is the way it is unless you can understand something about how that country got to be what it is now. You have to understand history to understand politics. It is exactly the same with the study of life on Earth. You can't fully understand life today without knowing something about the history that it's gone through. Um, as revealed in places like Dinosaur National Monument uh, outside the town of Vernal, Utah. This is a really cool place, by the way. Uh, it's a dinosaur dig site. Uh, where the scientists actually left a lot of the bones in place and ended up building a, a sh or the, the, the park service built a shelter over them. Uh, so in air conditioned comfort, you can walk right up to these dinosaur bones and even touch some of them in, in position. Uh, they're left as they were found. Uh, so yeah, this is one of many places where you can see that life on earth has some kind of history. How are we going to figure out that history? 1831, uh, a commander in the British Navy, Captain Robert Fitzroy, is getting ready for a survey voyage to South America. If you're going to have a Navy, you've got to have very accurate maps and charts. Uh, because it would do no good if you're sailing ships, which are very expensive, you know, get uh, destroyed and your crew is all killed because the ships crash into a rock that wasn't marked on your charts. You know, that, that is, is really not a good thing to have happen. Then as now, you know, if you're going to have a Navy, you've got to have accurate maps of, uh, you know, where the land is. 
and you need charts of, you know, what's the shape of the coastline, how deep is the water, you need all of that information. And the British Navy sent out dozens of ships at about this time. This is really when Great Britain is becoming a global naval power, and they want to be able to send warships anywhere that they're needed. And so they're sending out a lot of ships on these mapping and exploring expeditions. And Fitzroy was leading one of them on a ship called Her Majesty's Ship Beagle. And he was looking for somebody who could go with him. There would be sailors, of course, and officers, um, a couple of uh, Royal Marines and you know cooks and people like that and a doctor and so on. But he was looking for a naturalist. He wanted to bring somebody who could describe and study uh, the animals, uh, the plants, uh, the rocks and minerals, things like that, because that could be of important use for the Navy. You know, if you're thousands of miles away and your mast falls down, remember, these are sailing ships we're talking about here. Uh, this is just before the uh, time when people start putting engines on ships. Hmm, oddly enough, yes. Um, he wants to bring somebody along, you know, who could, he wants to keep records of, you know, where are tall trees growing? Because if your mast falls down, it would be very nice to know where you can go to get new timber. Uh, it would be very nice to know things like, if I get shipwrecked here, are there animals that are good to eat that we can shoot? Uh, if we get shipwrecked here, are the indigenous people uh, going to treat us nicely or kill us and eat us. You know, this is all information that is, you know, of, of military use. And Captain Fitzroy wanted to bring somebody along. And so he asked around. And he asked a friend of his who was a professor at Cambridge University uh, named uh, John Stevens Henslow. And Professor Henslow wanted to go him himself. And Henslow said, I want to go. And his wife said, that's great, you can go. And Henslow said, I can't go. And that makes perfect sense if you've ever been married. And Henslow said, well, I can't go. And his wife said, no, really, it's OK, you should go. And Henslow said, look, I have a student who just graduated. Uh, he was actually preparing for a career as a minister, of all things. But he's very knowledgeable. He's learned a lot from me about biology. He knows his rocks and fossils very well. He is also very easy to get along with, which is important when you're on a small sailing ship where you're going to be you know, in the middle of the ocean for weeks in very tight quarters, smelling each other's feet you know, with a, um, you know, with, with, you know, with, with the same people day in and day out for weeks on end. You know, it's, it's like a, it's like an eight hour bus ride to a state band festival, except lasting, uh, except lasting for weeks. Under those circumstances, you want somebody who's really easy to get along with. And this guy certainly was. So he met Fitzroy they hit it off, and Her Majesty's ship Beagle left England on December 27, 1831, with our young hero on board, a kid by the name of Charles Darwin, or as his friends called him, Chuck D. Actually, I'm kidding. They did not call him that. The Beagle's main mission was to chart the waters of South America. And this they did. You don't even see all the details here, but they sailed up and down those coasts. Uh, Darwin was able to get away from the ship and take some voyages inland. So he explored the Andes Mountains. He explored the Brazilian rainforest. He explored the grasslands of Argentina. Um, he... Uh, um, collected plants and animals and rocks and fossils and was able to have them shipped back uh, to, to Great Britain 
uh, for scientists back at home to study, uh, built himself quite a good reputation that way, and made a lot of discoveries that we just haven't got time for. Um, oh, incidentally, um, the Beagle actually found a, uh, a, a new route threading among the islands off the southern tip of South America to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, it's still called Beagle Channel, and there is a mountain called Mount Darwin um, by the side of the Beagle Channel, and Fitzroy named it after Darwin because Darwin's quick thinking actually saved their lives um, when their boat almost upset. So yeah, this, this, you know, Darwin's a young kid just out of college and he does heroic, crazy things like sailing around the world in a sailing ship. And we don't have time to discuss everything that they saw and did. Uh, Darwin kept a diary and ended up publishing an edited version of this uh, under the title Voyage of the Beagle, if you want the full story. Uh, so that's the Beagle in the Beagle Channel, uh, some rather dangerous waters, but they are meeting up with some of the indigenous people of the southern tip of South America. We don't have time for the whole story, but I'll focus on one brief episode. Three years into this voyage, everybody is really sick of each other and they're ready to go home. So they go up the Pacific coast of South America and start crossing the Pacific, and they stop for food and water on a small rocky group of islands 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, uh, right on the equator. Uh, they're called the Galapagos Islands, and they look like this. They are not peaceful tropical islands with sandy beaches and coral reefs and waiters bringing you fruity rum drinks with paper umbrellas. Um, they're prone to pretty severe drought. Uh, the waters around them are cool uh, because there's a current coming up from the South Pole that keeps them nice and, and chilled. And they're also volcanic. Uh, there are eruptions that still happen to this day. The last big one was in June 2018, uh, but those islands are basically all volcanoes. And there are still some rumblings there. Uh, there was a little bit of lava that one of them spilled back in uh, January 2020. Um, I'm not sure if there was activity after that, uh, but yeah, these things are still active. Uh, what you're looking at there is a lava flow that's hardened into solid rock. And relatively speaking, the Galapagos Islands are much younger than the South American mainland. Darwin was able to look at the rocks and use Stano's and Smith's principles uh, to work out these relative ages. Uh, the Galapagos Islands are, relatively speaking, quite young. They have not been around nearly as long as the South American continent has. Okay, so what? It turns out if you go to the Galapagos, there is a lot of wildlife, and the wildlife of the Galapagos looks similar to what you would see on the South American mainland, but it's not identical. Uh, for example, this is the Galapagos hawk. It's only found in the Galapagos Islands. It is in the same genus as uh, the red-tailed hawk, uh, Buteo jamaicensis. Uh, it's in the same genus as the red-shouldered hawk, which is another one that you could see around here. So it's similar, and yet at the same time, it's not identical to either of those. It is a species all its own, and the only place in the world you'll find it is the Galapagos Islands. Huh. Um, there are penguins in the Galapagos. You know, we think of penguins as living, you know, in Antarctica, uh, but the Galapagos penguin actually lives on the equator. Um, in fact, occasionally they might even swim across the equator uh, into the northern hemisphere. 
So just barely, they are Northern Hemisphere penguins. It's similar to penguins that you'd find in South America, uh, farther south on the South American coast, but it's not the same. And it's only found in the Galapagos Islands. Huh, why? The same is true for Galapagos marine iguanas, uh, these uh, lizards that um, hang around on rocky coastlines, soak up the sun, and then jump into the cold seawater and swim around and eat seaweed, which is kind of a weird thing for a lizard to do. Uh, there are three or four species of mockingbird that are not found anywhere else in the world but the Galapagos. Uh, there are giant tortoises that are similar to the gopher tortoises you could find in North and South America. But at the same time, the, that, that species is only found in the Galapagos. There's a tomato, a wild tomato species that is found only in the Galapagos. Uh, there are wild prickly pear cactus that are found only in the Galapagos. And you keep getting this pattern of the Galapagos Islands having animals and plants that are similar to what you'd see on the South American mainland, but not identical. Huh, why? I'll finish with this. Probably the most famous life forms in the Galapagos are a group of seed-eating birds uh, called finches. Uh, we have finches in around here. The finch that you know best is going to be the cardinal. Uh, those are finches. Uh, if you go bird watching, you might spot gold finches or um, uh, purple finches around here. Uh, but there are 14 different species of finch in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, this is one of them, the small ground finch. Different species can be found on different islands, which is weird. Why should some species only occur on certain of those islands, but not all of them? But each species has a distinctive way of life, and each one shows adaptation to that way of life. Its anatomy, especially the beak, is shaped in such a way that makes it possible for that finch to have that way of life. The small ground finch, small beak, specializes on eating tiny seeds. The large ground finch on the right, great big beak, specializes in eating larger seeds and uses that larger beak, which can exert more bite force. Uh, the cactus finch, very long and narrow beak, um, specializes in hopping around on cactus and eating seeds and uh, flower parts and bugs that long beak makes it possible for it to feed among the spines of a very spiky plant. They're all finches, they all share a common structure, and yet they all are adapted to different lifestyles. And that adaptation is reflected most obviously in the beak. So here on the left, you have that small beaked ground finch, uh, with a tiny beak that's very good for handling small seeds. And then the large beak ground finch with this great big beak, almost like a parrot. But there's no parrots on the islands. What there are are finches that have beaks like parrots. Why? The Galapagos finches look like South American species, notably a group of birds called the grassquits. Uh, this is one of them, Tiaris bicolor, and yet they are not identical to South American finches. They're unique to the Galapagos, and you have all these species, and they all are adapted to different ways of life, like the woodpecker finch, uh, which probes around in uh, rotten wood uh, to pick up bugs and is actually uh, will use tools to do it. Uh, that woodpecker finch has picked up a little piece of a, of a stick and is using it to poke around in rotten wood and uh, eat some nice termites or something. Oh, my personal favorite is the vampire finch with an extremely sharp beak. 
uh, so-called because it sneaks up behind uh, nesting seagulls and pecks them on the butt and draws blood and laps up the blood. It actually reminds me of a boss I used to have who was also very good at sneaking up on you and stabbing you in the butt, metaphorically. But this finch does it literally. And as Darwin wrote, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, what he means is an original small number of bird species in these islands, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. It's almost like, call me crazy here, that these finches are here in the Galapagos and they have the similarities and differences that they do because they come from an ancestor that lived in South America, got blown, maybe blown to the Galapagos by a storm or something like that. It doesn't really matter how. And over time, that ancestral finch species changed and produced new species of finch only in the Galapagos that had not existed on Earth before. Huh, weird idea. And we will leave it right there. And when we come back, I'll start talking about where we go from here. Uh, again, I'm not gonna test you on historical data. You don't have to know that Darwin and Abraham Lincoln were born on the same day in the same year. February 12th, 1809. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm not going to hold you responsible for things like that, but focus on the ideas here. Focus on what people are thinking about. And so I will go ahead and stop the recording right now. <laughs> 